Facebook Live. All right, we're going to go live here shortly, and I will. Uh, so 15, 15, Country Coach Cast, the set up position. Talking compound, thick, recurve, and error. Arch Institute. All right, we're going to go live here in a second, fellas. And as soon as we do, and it's official, I'll do with a quick intro, okay? All right, stand by. Three, two, one, go live. Got it. It looks like we are live. Let me double check my Facebook feed. Usually it'll show up and say, oh, you guys are alive. Uh -huh. There it is. We are officially live. Anybody who logs in, Sean Moore, our wonderful guest of all, can you go to Facebook and share this live feed for me, my friend? Um, while we are getting ready to start, officially start, Episode 15 of the Archie Coach Cast. I am here once again with the one year older, none the less wiser, Larry Wise. <laughs> Happy belated birthday there, friend. Oh, yes. They keep coming. Thank you. Um, and our esteemed doc, Mr. Richard McEwen. How are you doing, doc? I'm esteeming. You were steamy. It is steamy. I'm out on my porch because my wife took over my office and it's it's starting the temperature's starting to, to yeah. creep up. So it's okay. It's okay though, you know. So if you hear that noise in the background, everyone, I apologize. You'll get over it. I'm not worried about it. Don't mm -hmm. get caught up in uh, production. It's the value of the content that matters. Um so today we are hopping into back into the form series in the beginning of the archie coach cast we really started with just talking about the steps of the nts form stuff like that um and we sort of got away from it because we just like guests kept coming and we have a guest here guest there mm -hmm. so this discussion today is going to be um the setup position of the nts shot cycle and it's the setup position as it's uh as it as it references compound archery, Olympic recurve archery, and you guessed it, folks, barebow archery. Um, mm -hmm. Just a, a quick reminder for those of you that are joining in, we got some viewers on Facebook. Please go share this live feed, um, bring people to the Archery Coach Cast, tell them to check us out on YouTube, do all that good stuff because we we appreciate that support. Um, well, gentlemen, we just got back from Joe at Nationals. I want to say Your that team we, did well. we did well. We took three kids this year. So first time from my, my Joe ad program. Well, I shouldn't say my, my wife and I, um, that we've taken shooters to Joe ad nationals. That's the first time I've been to a Joe ad nationals since I was about 15 years old, maybe 14 years old. So yeah, it's, it's been a while. Um, a lot of things have changed. A lot of things haven't changed. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> um, but it was a it was a very good experience. There was multiple world and national records broken. Um, you were talking. You were just referencing a minute ago uh, about Sawyer, who was on your junior dream team. Yes. Uh, yeah, with the national uh, junior dream team program that ended two years ago. Uh, yes, he was on that and uh, developing developing nicely and wow has he really turned it up here this year 714 that's that's amazing shooting congratulations that's Sawyer smoking. yeah that's smoking there's another young lady who I had highlighted on the Instagram for Barebell Project um uh uh Isabella Aguilar I think is her correct name she is deaf she broke the Bowman bare bow cub record with like a 619. <laughs> Incredible shooting. 
her, her she has an archery advocate it's her dad who stand who, who gives her the signals for like when she can shoot and you know and, and stuff like that or with announcements and you know and i yeah. i was standing there with claire z a friend of mine who if you know don't if you follow bearbow at all you should know who claire is she's one of the top female shooters um in the united states probably the world um for sure and we were standing there and, and took a picture with with isabella because it's such just it's just you have a deficit in in the hearing and, it, and i we we're talking with the dad and i said maybe in some ways there might be a benefit to that because that's, yeah i was just going to say oh. that that's fewer things to distract you from your mental thought process yeah so but at the same time that's a real as we all know, the shooting line is a lonely, lonely place because it is just you and your thoughts. I mean, so for her, it's got to be like real. That's all she's got going on is is the thoughts in her head and, and trying to. But he, whoever, I'm not sure who her coach is, but whoever has worked with her has done an amazing job working with the dad and communicating how the steps, the steps of shooting and, and going through Barebo. Um, real nice kid, so... There's, there was quite a few records broken this weekend at Joe Nationals and, and shout out to USA Archery. They did a phenomenal job. Um, shout out to the judging crew. Um, we, we are on the Cub range with Evan um, back and forth to the cadet and junior range as well and, and all over. But, you know, and there was, you know, there's some hiccups with scoring and stuff like that. And got a, I had a pleasure to see some of the judges that I, um, you know, communicate with online and they did a phenomenal job. So shout out to the, the USA archery judges who did Joe at nationals as well, but we, we did well, you know, Evan finished 12th, um, got his, his Olympian pin in the last 36 arrows of the two days of qualifying. So Good. exciting for him shot really, you know, just kept getting better as the weekend went. So I can't ask for much more than that. Um, and then Maggie got first in the nation. She was top. She was, she finished like um, 120, 130 points ahead of second place. So it was, it was a good score for that purpose, but it's far from what her potential is. Um, mm -hmm. It was a good practice session for senior nationals. Um, so it gives her a good idea of where she really truly is at right now under some tournament stress. So she's got some work to do. And then Emily, Rodriguez she's she's one of mine that started like last winter um she she was she sort of like she was a one of the top two barebow shooters in like the Bowman class three years ago and then there a time came where the their family moved she switched school districts COVID came they, after COVID, they decided they were going to kind of get back into it, came to me. Um, and it's just like, so we, a lot of form changes and stuff like that. She, she ended up finishing fourth. She was in second and day after day one, she had a couple of blunders in the second day, but she finished fourth. So, and, mm -hmm. and she's come a long, long way with some serious, you know, some tough obstacles in life and now she's working a job and all that stuff so i think i think sometimes we underestimate how much stress and and how difficult all of those life changes can be for a kid oh yeah, yeah. when it comes to shooting and competing but sounds like evan needs to come up and spend some time with me now yeah i he does he, no he 100 percent does i don't i i <laughs> I want to be a parent. I'd, I'd rather have you coach him. To be really honest. I just want to be a parent. I don't want, I, I have to coach all those other kids. I'd rather have him with you. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. Um, we can, we can have that discussion afterwards. Yeah. But. So I guess we got to get in the setup. Why don't you give us a start there, coach Larry Wise, and, and let's talk well, about that setup position for compound Olympic recurve. Teachers are always reviewing at the beginning of a new learning session. So you have to remember what we put in place so far. It was months ago. Yeah. <laughs> so of course, we had our stance set. We had uh, our hands set uh, on the bow. And uh, the last thing we did before setup was to complete our posture. And uh, that has to do with setting a head position. 
and chin level had turned to the target. So your eyesight is on the target surface and you have your shoulder line established. So uh, for the compounder, uh, that shoulder line is pointing well left of the target for a right-handed shooter. And that's because your two hands are only a foot apart uh, with a recurve you can expand that recurve at this point some very easily. And so you can rotate that shoulder line so that the shoulder line points to the bow hand. This is setting the barrel of the gun, in other words. So uh, we can set that mostly, not completely at this point for the recurve and also for the bare bow. Uh, so it's during the setup then that that shoulder line, that barrel of the gun has to be finalized. And then once that's finalized and the bow is raised, you can finish drawing the bow. But we've got to get the bow raised in the setup step. And that's, that's where we are. Okay, so, um, just to repeat, we got to get the bow raised and we have to get the barrel of the gun set. And that happens during the setup steps. Okay, so um, both arms raised at the same time when you do this. So you don't raise one up and then the other. So it's, it's a unit that you're raising up. And that helps you in protecting your shoulder line. Uh, if you have some other way of raising, then you're endangering uh, raising one shoulder higher than another. And I see that quite a bit when people raise the bow up quite high. Uh, they aren't aware of it, that they've just now destroyed their shoulder line. And we have that shoulder line set and we'd like to keep it that way. So um, you need to think about that whenever you're raising your bow, whether it's compound, recurve, uh, bare bow, set up. Um, yeah, so here are the, here are the points uh, that we look at when we're doing a coaching course, a level three coaching course. We look at all these details in the setup and uh, you can read down over them. So with the compound bow, this is from the compound form steps, this particular chart. Hands remain at brace distance. Yeah, you can't expand that compound bow like you can. So your hands remain about 12 inches apart. And so that keeps your shoulder line pointing well left of the target. Uh, so the shoulder line is not going to rotate to be parallel with the arrow in this setup step. And that's a major difference between compound and recurve form. Because the recurves uh, archers have rotated the shoulder line here in, in this step as they're raising the bow. They're going to complete that rotation. Compounders can't. Okay, so with the compound, the arrow is pretty much in line, straight down range to the target. That's how we raise the compound. Recurve, not so. What, what do you do with your um, bare bow? Same as recurve, Frank? Yeah, at this point in bare bow, 100% um, try to follow the, the idea of setting the barrel of the gun and having it completed and having that alignment essentially completed at this step. It's super, super crucial with dealing with target panic, um, not just in Baribo across the board, but in Baribo, we deal with it a little bit more directly because that's what the class requires. So when you get those, if you get, if you're at looking at overhead position 
um, mm -hmm. of setup and you are at that parallel to the arrow, more compound, full draw shoulder position, you know, so the, the shoulders are here and the arrow is here. Whereas in, you know, in bare bow or recurve, you're, you set that barrel of the gun and it's full, mm -hmm. that full angle, yeah. that archer's wedge that we talked about. It makes a huge impact on your full draw position if you set that early um, and you maintain it and get it done. You got to get kind of, I like to say it is you get it done and get it out of the way. Right. So the, the arrow line, though, for recurve bare bow, the arrow is not pointed at the target. No, it's going to be slightly left. It's pointing left of the target. Compound, so the arrow line is straight down range at the target when we raise the bow, when we, when we set up. I think there's a little bit too much emphasis put on on that left a little bit. And, and that's only because I see people like they do this big wide thing oh. like this. And oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's not that's that's not where the arrow pointing left um essentially comes from it's the idea of of aligning those shoulders that actually creates that position and puts it left but mm -hmm. it gets exaggerated a little bit i just wanted to bring that up so mm -hmm. anyway go ahead larry sorry for the no that's that's <laughs> yeah that's those are the things that we have to discuss the you know what the differences are yeah uh, and of course this area is again uh a major difference between compound versus recurve. Yeah, and the shoulder line uh, is a big part of that as well as where the arrow's pointed. So uh, just to repeat, with compound shoulder line and this, when we raise the bow is pointing well left of the target. The arrow is pointing straight down range. With recurve, you've already rotated your shoulders to be pointed more towards your bow hand. And as you're setting up, you're expanding that recurve to complete the setting of the barrel of the gun, complete the, the shoulder alignment to the bow hand. So from overhead on the recurve archer, we would see a triangle. Uh, overhead with the compound, we see a trapezoid where the back line uh, eventually, after we draw the bow, will be parallel to, to the arrow. I'm going to pull up the uh, not, overhead. Position. Not yet in the setup phase. Yeah. Well, I'm going to pull up the overhead position um, uh, diagram. Okay. A lot. Maybe if I can find it. Uh -huh. Yeah. So the compounders won't be rotating that shoulder line to be parallel to the arrow until they are drawing the bow. So that does not happen yet in, in the setup. Phase. Yep. I'm going to um, actually, I have the proper holding alignment uh, diagram. Um, that we can actually look at there. Mm -hmm. And it's actually your presentation, Larry. So we can click, just give, give the idea of what oh, that is. Oh, this. Okay. Yeah. Oh. So we have some slides here. Yeah. These are those, the slides from your, um, right. holding position. Yep. So here's like what you were talking about earlier. This shows your, your right. diagram of the shoulder alignment. Right, so this is uh, what the compounder would look like uh, before they set up. Uh, and when they raise the bow, the arrow might be pointed a little bit more straight at the target. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then... but you, you see where the shoulder line is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Yep, and then we have that stage three shoulder line rotation. 
compound national training system, that raise set up position, drawing, you rotate your shoulder to the line about your spine as your hips and head position remain fixed. And I think this is something that we, that I think that statement there um, about your spine and your hips and your head position remain fixed. That yes. is super, super, super important for the consistency of the shot. And it does right. not matter what discipline of archery you shoot. Right. So your hip line is pointed left of the target. And your upper body will eventually turn. Your shoulder line will turn, but the hips will not. And your head, which was sat looking at the target, chin level looking at the target, remains there. And your, your vision remains fixed on the target surface. Right? Yeah, this, this point, this head position thing transfers across so many sports. Yeah. And, uh, and, and since I've worked with some other sports um, over the past year and a half, um, I, I noticed that particularly uh, like the basketball player stepping to the foul line and not taking time to set the shoulders in the head position and just, you know, smoothly working and up and, and projecting the ball to the target. But if their head isn't set the same every time, how can they repeat their form? Yeah. Yeah, I saw one place kicker uh, I think for the Texans. And he was very deliberate on every place kick at when he finally got set waiting for the snap of the ball, he made sure he set his shoulders back and set his head position. And so he had the same look at where the ball is going to be placed every time and his accuracy was quite high. Yeah, uh, we got to do the same in archery if you're moving your head and uh, having it a different place for each shot, uh, you can't expect to have repeat performance. Yeah, I think, I, I think there's a, it should be mentioned um, like bow hunters often talk about, oh, you know, you got to practice every position and you have to do all those things and, and you're right you do um but this is the foundation of your shot like it's the idea that you need to have a really 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 strong base of mm -hmm. learning to shoot and that's what this is so that when you do deviate from that position from your knees in a tree stance stand, yeah when yeah stance, when stance changes, varies and in bow hunting geez, hunting out of a saddle now, all of those things. Like you have to, you, you're still, you still have that foundation. You still have that base to have a repeatable shot. I've shot, I sh I've shot trad out of a saddle and it is not easy to do. I love <laughs> saddle hunting, but at the same time, like it's not the most conducive for a really, really, really accurate shot. I'll take a platform and sticks any day for that purpose, especially if it's like an all day sit type of deal. But, you know, and I, I, I think we oftentimes like, Oh, I shoot animals. I don't shoot paper. And, you know, I, I don't have, I think, I think we, there's a little bit of a misconception that the idea of paying this much attention to your shooting form and your process as a bow hunter is probably like the ultimate commitment to the animal that you're pursuing. Mm -hmm. So I just want to, yeah. I kind of want to put that out there for the bow hunters who happen to watch this and that are, that get into the idea of trying to become better shooters, not just better bow hunters. Right. So yeah, um, you, you, regardless of your stance or how you have turned in the stand, you can still manage your upper body, your shoulders and your head and get them set. 
And that's, that's critical to drawing the bow while the animal is present. Yep. Because you still want to draw the bow to your head. Yep. We don't want to be moving the head. Uh, that leads to poor accuracy. Absolutely. It's the, last thing, <laughs> the last thing we want when we're hunting out of a tree stand and you get one shot. Oh, same thing in traditional archery. And I try to explain that people to people all the time because the trad yeah. world is definitely a little bit more, oh, you know, do what makes you happy, shoot how you want. You know, I'm only shooting 15 yards, you know, and I, and I have this discussion often. I'm like, yes, there's 100% truth to that. But at the same time, <laughs> when you're you're never doing wrong by trying to be more accurate and it is proven that taking these steps having that checklist in your brain reducing the amount of extra movement and in this position is this this the setup position in my opinion is the uh, maybe the number two number three most important position in the entire shot process is mm -hmm. everything you've done up to this point, if you uh, if you haven't done it correctly, it makes the whole back half of the shot so much more difficult to reverse. Right. Yeah. And and yeah. And before we raise the bow, we have the shoulders and the head position set. Mm -hmm. Critical to all forms of shooting. Yes. Yeah. And if you pay attention to it, you will benefit. Yep. So we have this mid draw position shows the the shoulders are starting to change angle a little bit right larry yeah, so that's that's the the coiling so we're getting into the draw to load step here for the compound uh the recurve has already done this right and and have completed this by the time the bow is set up to target level yeah but yeah, compounders have to play catch up and as they're drawing the bow. That's right. From that draw to load, draw to load yeah. phase is where that catch up happens. Right. And that that's because of the nature of the compound, the physics involved. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And then we have um, that proper holding position. Yeah, for compound. So we end up with shoulder line here, uh, parallel to the arrow. We want to get at least that far. Some can get uh, a little bit more rotation than that. Fine. Um, I've not been good at doing that. Uh, I find my back works best for me in the position that we're showing right here. Yeah, I get best use out of the right side of my back. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think if you get a little bit behind, like the way I like to explain it, it, it's going to vary for everyone. I think it's important to understand that this full draw position, um, that elbow position at full draw is going to change depending on how you are built and put together. It's not going to be the identical. This is just like a, a general rule of thumb, but you have to be comfortable and you have to leave some room for that expansion phase so that, that afterwards you have to leave some room for the transfer to hold and the expansion at full draw so from this position where i'm come back and i'm in my anchor here if you're too far look watch how my shoulder comes forward and my elbow comes back i'm taking away from the ability to actually get into my back and actually be able to expand through the shot same thing if the draw length is short and I'm here and my elbow's forward, well, my shoulder line is no longer parallel, but there's no expansion to be had because I haven't gotten to that point yet. I'm, I'm short, so it's bringing my elbow out to where my cursor is right now. It's bringing it out here. Mm -hmm. You're not actually able to get into your back. and Right, You're, you can't fully transfer. You're, you're going to still be holding too much with the arms. Yep. Then your shoulder and arm. And yeah. Right. And, uh, and again, uh, we're going to, this common pitfall of bow shops um, and stuff like that. But we talk about setting up bows. 
you got list for all of you that are in for all of you that are are in bow shops or um coaches or parents of young shooters or shooters yourselves setting oh, hold on a second sorry about that phone call coming through um you have to make sure that you you're setting your bow up so that you are full your full drop position is like this mm -hmm. that's the goal mm -hmm. uh, you know it's crucial for the proper execution of the shot mm -hmm. uh, correct mm -hmm. Um, uh, let's see one here. thing I wanted to mention is go ahead. Uh, how high do we raise the bow? Um, I recommend that we raise it high enough so that the sight appears above the spot, your hand under it, under the spot, and then draw at that level. That would allow the sight to. Uh, settle down to the spot by the time you're anchored and the peep comes in line in front of your eye. Yeah. What, what do you do for your bare bow, Frank? Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, it's similar to Olympic recurve. Um, when I raise to draw, though, I have a specific height that I raise it only to promote repeatability. I think it varies by some people, but I pay attention that when I raise to draw from Barbo again, so in Rem Rhett, well, let me close this out and pull up the Olympic recurve, um, mm -hmm. uh, the Olympic recurve checklist so that people can see it. In this situation, there's not much difference from Barbo to Olympic recurve when it comes to the setup position. Um, it's more along the lines of it's going to actually change a little bit because some people are longer, shorter, draw lengths change. Um, but, you know, there's some common themes that you can see amongst the best barebow shooters and Olympic recurve shooters across the world. And that is that, that the hands raise together at pre-draw distance. I do implement a little bit of pre-draw in bare bow and I advocate for it so that you, you actually do that a little bit as you start to set the barrel of the gun before you raise the draw. Right. Yeah, the, so the bow expands. Right. Okay. You start loading, you, ha you, ha you set your hook, you set your grip. And again, I'll, I'll be honest with you, Larry, you teach about like with the release hand, you put the release hand on, set the grip and then set the final position of the release hand. Yeah. In recurve and barebo, we should be advocating that we go back and double check the, the hook. Make sure that the pressure on the fingers is where it's supposed to be, where you shoot it, however it is that you do it. You know, um, in, in recurve, we're shooting one above, two below. So it changes the dynamic of the release a little bit because the fingers are coming in that position. They're coming off of, and if we were to, uh, I can't really do it we'll put it upside down. You're coming off of a squared string this way. Actually, it would be more along the lines of like that. The string is a little bit more squared between these two fingers, the index finger and the ring finger. This doesn't really give me a fair angle. It'd be more like this. And then that this bottom finger just kind of floats on there, that mm -hmm. 10, 20% that, that they talk about. Um, in bare bow, because we have all three fingers engaged on the string a little bit more and a lot of shooters shoot with a deeper hook, it's different because it's not squared. It's on that angle. So it's a little bit harder. So you have to make sure that you're, you are double checking that hook before you go into your setup position because that may change as you raise the draw. But from this position, after you set that pre-draw here, you know, arm is still inside elbows inside the arrow, all that stuff. When we raise to draw, that hinging motion of raising everything together. Now notice when I raise up, this hand comes straight up. It doesn't move forward and it doesn't really move back. Just by the nature of the hinging, as we raise up, you automatically are drawing almost like by coiling, like three quarters of your draw length. So mm -hmm. it's from here and just by coiling, look how far back you end up and I still haven't even started pulling yet. Um, when I do that, my palm or the grip of my bow, I ultimately end up putting it right over the target. That's for two reasons. For me with bare bow, because the anchor is a little bit higher, 
it when I come into anchor, it drops down in anywhere from 20 to, to 50 meters. A lot of times my point on just drops right in and stays there. It's perfect. Um, but the other thing is with the putting the palm of the hand in that same spot, I visually put the palm of my hand, palm of my hand, bow hand, my grip over the target, put it there. It also keeps me from trying to aim too early. So those are two reasons that I do it that way, as opposed to, um, you know, that's a difference between compound um, and even Olympic recurve. Anyway, uh, do you, did you want to say before we go too, too far down the recurve barebell mm -hmm. rabbit hole, did you want to say any more about that setup position with compound? No, we're, we're good. Okay. Yeah. Um, I already talked about coiling by rotating. And if you guys see this, this is a proficiency checklist that we use when we teach um, like the level three or the SDDA classes or anything that, or when we work with shooters like in form classes or one-on-one, -on -one, these proficiency checklists go through and have all of the contents, the checklist for you to be able to reference and go back. This was created, this compound one or the recurve and compound one were created by Larry. Um, uh, I created the barebow one, but it's just yeah. a, a adjusted so version of the recurve one. Yeah, these these steps are in the level two, level three manuals. Yeah, the steps are, but the proficiency checklist is, is well. Yeah, What's the items out of the checklist yeah. came right out of the manual. They're right. they're in there. Yeah, the barebow one is not. That is a yeah. Frank McDonough creation. So everybody that's, knows. <laughs> that's Frank's manual. Yeah, that's Frank's manual because Barbell hasn't that's been really level yet. Level it's yet. Called, um, called frankly speaking. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, the yeah, setup. The, the, oh, go, the, sorry, sorry, Doc. Uh, as I've been hearing this, I've been thinking about what people call instinctive shooting, more of the, um, you know, just a, a, a long bow and, 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 and shooting at a, a either at a target, a stationary target or a moving target. And I, I, I find that a lot of people that do that just sort of are, are flail, flailing arrows and hoping the target will come in to the uh, arrow and sometimes that's the case, but the more you can do it step by step, like we're talking about here, and we should come up with a checklist for the so-called traditional uh, uh, instinctive shooting. Uh, and I find, because I've been thinking about this a lot, and I and I think uh, Byron Ferguson and others I've shot with, we, when when especially if you're shooting at flight targets, uh, if if the target is say is it's it's going from my right to the left, I come in above the target, and move toward the front of the target. That that, that way you can tell what the trajectory of the target is, and then you reach a point in front of the target if your timing is right, wh where the two will converge. If you try to come up underneath the target, you'll never catch it. Because hmm. um, I've been thinking about that a good bit, and and I think it's really I I think uh, I was shooting a good bit this weekend when I, when I was off kitchen duty up at the range there in Morgantown, and using my longbow and just thinking about these things for today, and so uh, there, there there's very little difference in, in terms of what we're talking about here on, on all of the three. Uh, and, and if you don't do it consistently, then you're just, you, you, you'll hit something occasionally. And that's almost by accident. But if you want to do a pre predictably good shot, then you have to stick to a, a pro process and, and, let, and, and, and let the process guide you, not you trying to guide the process. That's all I have to say. No, that's that's actually a really good idea, Doc, to to take a more of an approach in creating our own instinctive checklist as well, because that's something that you definitely know a lot better than I do, because I'm an aimer. I shoot competitive barebow, so I'm an aimer. There's there's no questions. The this the form and the shot process is built around 
having the ability to hold and aim and shoot literally as tight a group as possible at longest range possible. That's what we do. Um, so yeah, I think that's a great idea. That might be a complete podcast episode in and of itself, to be completely honest with you. Um, if we, uh, we can get a hold of Byron, that would be a great way to, to break that up. Very carefully spelled out in his book, uh, mm-hmm. the book, be, uh, Become the Arrow. And, and it's really step by step. I mean, Larry's very familiar with that book. Mm-hmm. We, we wrote uh, the outline. Yeah, Doc, we wrote steps for the natural bow system. Yeah, we have them. Yeah, I have them. And, yeah. we, and we, we, we can do this at some point. Yeah. We'll definitely add that into the mix. Just to, uh, just to finish up, before we, we do have some questions and comments uh, from the Facebook Live. Um, mm-hmm. Just to, to finish up the bare bow recurve setup position, um, that bow hand raising under the target, gaze stays to the center of the ten ring. That is because you're using a sight. That's the difference between bare bow right. and Olympic recurve. Shoulder line open to the target um, and level. So your shoulders are down and level. You're not allowing these shoulders to creep or move. They're staying down the entire time so that when you do raise and you, you come into that position, that um, they stay down and level. Helps with the alignment. Draw hand finishes set up between bow shoulder and chin. You notice that when I do that, finish that coil and I raise the draw, that's where I end up at between right around the front shoulder, somewhere between the front shoulder and chin. I'm not doing a full coil because I'm sitting down, but um, there's a great video of, of Brady Allison uh, on World Archery's YouTube page called Shoot Like Me. I will try to add that into um, the comments below this on YouTube so you guys can see it. Really shows a great job and he does a great job explaining that. Arrows left of the line of target. Um, it's slight. I think it's more in some Olympic recurve forms that you'll see than as a, compared to bare bow, but um, it definitely is by just by the nature of the position of the body in the setup position. Um, you set your draw shoulder back, pre-draw closes shoulders, eyes on the target, no aim. Again, and, and I think in bare bow, this is definitely – um, a point of emphasis, the no aiming portion. I see so many times bare bow shooters, they do this and they automatically start aiming down the arrow from this position. They're not even at full draw. They're not even in a good pre-draw position because technically if you're in a proper pre-draw position, you can't aim. Arrow tips should be left to the target. I see bare bow shooters all the time, raise up and do this. They look right down the arrow and then they dr- try to draw back to anchor and look at their their elbow ends up way outside of the arrow alignment. They have poor alignment, and it just it's a nightmare for target panic. No aiming is happening. I cannot emphasize that enough at this position. Um, anything else to, before we get into some questions and comments on the the live feed? Anything else you guys want to talk about? No, nope. I'm good. Okay, well, we have a comment from Daniel Bell. It says, good afternoon, gentlemen. Going to be starting my first youth courses next week. Any tips for a new coach? I'm assuming what he's talking about, and this is the way we'll answer it. Um, he is – hold on a second. He is teaching youth beginner courses. Any recommendations? Um any any experience or, or things that you want to uh, you want to give them, Daniel? Daniel Bell is his name. Uh, well, after you discuss safety, the very next thing should be teaching the archers T. and that that's your base teaching tool always, and within that. Uh, you're teaching the holding position that your students want to get to. You're doing this without a bow. So you're rehearsing what they're going to do when they get the bow. So in, in that holding position, you're going to discuss with the student 
that they need to transfer holding into their back on the holding side. And from the very beginning then, you are teaching them the most important thing that they will do in shooting an arrow. And you're also teaching them then that that, that, that same important action of transferring, holding into the back is the most important part of the mental game. Yeah. So that's that I feel is essential when you're teaching beginner use or intermediate use is to continually repeat that at the beginning of each uh, coaching session, each practice session or meeting that, that you have. And uh, yeah, I have, I think I have a um, PowerPoint, my stick man PowerPoint thing that I can send. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you can email me. I'll send it to you. Larry at LarryWise.com. Yeah. And that goes through that, the entire step process. I guess, Daniel, the only other thing, and anybody else who watches this podcast on YouTube or the live feed on, on the Facebook page, this is your fir- this is your friend. Stretch band is your friend. Use it when you start with a new shooter. Do not put a bow in your hand right away. If you have access to a recurve, use a recurve. If not, Genesis bow, something along those lines. But don't skip over the stretch band. Um, it doesn't matter what level of a shooter you are. You should, in some ways, be using a stretch band um, you can do visualization and stuff with it. I mean, there's just so many options, but before, after you go over safety, after you go over T form and you want to get into teaching them the first few positions of the shot process, use the stretch band first. Mm-hmm. Um, I right. personally, I personally break the shot process down into three positions with a new shooter because it's a lot easier to explain to an eight year old, a 10 year old, position one, position two, and position three, as opposed to, okay, set your stance, put it these degrees, you know, it's all, it's all in the delivery. So, um, you know, but I'll, I'll set position one and that's the set position one for me is at the end of the set position and putting them in the proper position, making sure the hook is right or the release hand position, whatever it is you're, you're teaching at that moment, make sure the grip is set after the hook, making sure it's in the right position, making their shoulders are down and level. Um, make sure their head is between their shoulders and over their spine. That's the end of position one. One thing that that, that does, in my opinion, breaking it into position one, position two being the end of setup, position three being a full draw. Um, the one thing that that does is it also allows them to focus on the feel of the position. And kids will repeat a feel of something quicker than they will hear the words that you're saying and get it from the audio version, I guess you can say. So I'm, I'm a pretty, I'm a, I'm a huge advocate for, for breaking it into those three steps because then you can get into the transfer to hold the expansion, the aiming, the follow through, you know, the release follow through, you can get into that stuff afterwards, but getting them to that, getting them to that full drop, proper full drop position it's just so important for them to dr- truly do that back half of the shot correctly. So, Correct. um, you know, that's just can't emphasize that enough. Um, we had some other comments. Uh, let me double check here if I can find them. Um, there's so many people that came in or watching, finding the comments in the, uh, the newest comments. There we go. Um, no, I don't see it. There was just one, but I can't seem to find it now. Um, Kelly just had commented that, uh, Kelly Ott was her name, that she was, she's just a a little thing. She's, uh, like 110 pounds. She said, I'm I'm five foot, 110 pound female. And I, and I rarely can keep my elbow in alignment. And Kelly, there's probably a good chance that you need some, a form evaluation and that your draw length isn't isn't really where it needs to be if you're having a hard time with that alignment piece because that's the common denominator i can tell you i i I could probably speak for larry and doc you go you guys 
you teach a level three or have a bunch of students and the most common thing that we see is the draw length is half inch, three quarters of an inch, sometimes even more too short. Yeah. Makes it very difficult to be in that proper alignment position. But yes, you can see that at any tournament, 70% of the compound archers are set up short. Yes. 70%. That's by count. That's not, not a made up number. I've counted at tournaments. So. And Larry's been to yeah. plenty of tournaments to be able to do that. That's all I got. <laughs> Couple. Um, we have Miguel Cruz. Miguel, we did a uh, form evaluation with Miguel, Larry. Um, yes. Uh, let's see. He says, is there any advice to train better for indoor archery? Well, my default answer is going to be do more shooting drills. But what, what, uh, what, what, what's, your, what's your initial reaction to, to Miguel's question, Larry? Oh, for, for indoor? Training better for indoor archery, yeah. Yeah, well, same, same default answer as yours. <laughs> you got to have good posture. Yeah. Yeah, you got to set that, you know, have that set position complete with shoulder set and head position set. Uh, and then have the bow that fits so that you can raise and draw it to your head position and have proper alignment. Yeah, if you don't have the bow that fits, uh, then it's going to dictate to you what your head position is going to be. And you're not going to get happy shooting indoors or outdoors. Right. Gravity acts pretty much the same indoors or outdoors. You, you can prove that by walking out a window. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah doc's always good for one 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 zinger every other yeah other. <laughs> but no but 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 doc is right i mean it's how you're essentially moving in in opposition to gravity on every shot so you know gravity doesn't change but your body movement changes so if you can't reduce the amount of movement in the shot process to right. as minimal as possible, keep it su super, super simple. Um, mm -hmm. The more movement and things you add into it, the less repeatable your shot is. Now, we've had this discussion a million times. Yes, there are people who shoot really good archery at, at high levels that maybe don't have this exact form. Those people mm -hmm. also shoot ridiculous volumes of arrow, of arrows, to prepare for their tournaments when have for mm -hmm. decades we're teaching it in the idea that hey, listen if you struggle or you are having repeatability issues this is a pretty well documented and researched method of of shooting archery it's for you to maybe have a shorter um barrier to entry on shooting those higher scores instead of taking decades to do it um, or maybe not decades, maybe that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but you know, um, like that's why we have these discussions. That's why we essentially have this podcast. Um, and that's why we created the international archery Institute. Um, let me see. There was a, um, there was a comment asking why 70%. So we're going to go back real quick. Uh, mm -hmm. Kelly's Kelly's situation with the, with the full drop position, the compound. Um, and she said, well, why is 70% seem to be short? <laughs> well, I'll lack let you of knowledge. Yeah. Many people have a lack of knowledge of what proper holding position should be and why. And others have followed this wingspan rule where you measure the wingspan and you do these magic number things <laughs> and you get a draw length. Now those are all made up numbers, I guarantee you. You know, I have two degrees in mathematics. Somebody made up those numbers. They didn't come from science. Because when you use that formula, you end up short. <laughs> that's and that's what People do. And, and people hear things from other archers who are trying to be helpful and saying, well, you, you've got to 
put yourself in a position where you can really pull hard into the stops. And that's a short position. Yeah. But I, I prefer proper lineup, do it with finesse because simplicity repeats under pressure. Having the ability, and it is no different than Barebow, having the, the ability to be as relaxed as possible and, and just reduce the amount of things that you have to repeat without a doubt makes you more accurate. There's no question. Yeah. So anytime that you're adding tension into the shot process and the full draw position, you're hurting your chances of repeatability. Yeah. And that's, that's not just compound. You just get away with it more in certain aspects of archery. You can get away with it a little bit more in compound because you have the mechanical advantage of a compound bow and a release aid and all this other stuff, let off, all this other stuff. In the Olympic recurve, you get away with it a little bit more because you have a clicker, because you are shooting with a sight, because you're doing yeah. all of these things um that allow you to sort of it's like a band-aid on what the actual problem is in barebo you don't have that in barebo it's one of those things like you really find out how truly repeatable and um relaxed you are at full draw because it and i listen this is this might be a little bit of a bold statement but I am willing to bet that 99.9% .9 of your Olympic recurve shooters and compound shooters, if you give them a barebow ring, you tell them to put the tip of the arrow on the middle of the target within a half a second, that arrow is going to be gone. And it's going to be gone because their shot process isn't really the most, it, it, it really isn't combating target panic. We still use clickers and all of these other things you know, and that's why Kelly, just to go back and talk about the, the body position, I have found as a shop owner and as a coach that that 70% of people who are short on their full draw position, that is sort of like the opening the door to target panic. They don't have it, but you're opening the door for that to happen. And the reason you're doing that is because your body wants to be stable at at full draw and if you're not stable at full draw if your alignment isn't good yes well if your alignment is poor you are going to recruit many more muscles right okay so then at your holding position when you're using all of this muscle your body wants to get rid of the load it's under stress yeah. And your body wants to avoid stress. So it dumps the shots. <laughs> yeah. They talk about dip bangs all the time. I hear that. That's a, that's a big, it's a big topic of conversation in the compound yeah. dip bangs and are changing stabilizer weight and changing grips and doing all of this stuff. And, and, you know, then, and I also heard uh, this weekend, as a matter of fact, you may have seen my, my, my post, Larry. I don't know if you saw it on Facebook. Oh, yeah, I saw that one. Yeah. And yes. the, the coaches are shortening co open compound shooters a half an inch or shortening D loops to combat target panic to force them to pull into the back wall a little bit harder, I guess, is the reason. Yeah. Um, don't do that. It's a that problem. exacerbates the muscle recruitment. Ah. It's that, the exact that, opposite, yeah. exact opposite right. effect on a shooter. Yeah. Okay. And uh, don't do yeah. that. It's a problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I saw your post on that. I, yeah, I commented on it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just all we're doing yeah. is hurting ourselves. Lots, and, lots of homespun technique and remedies. Yeah, or or not, or it's a YouTube search and hey, somebody did this at work for them. I'm gonna try it and then use it as gospel. Um, you know, that happens too, which people can do that with us. They can say, All right, well, these three guys yeah. were talking about it and they sound like they know what they're talking about. So that's gotta be the way to do it. Hey, if you find another way that works, that's great. If it, and and if just adding a hinge works for you, that's great too. But 
you know, I, I just think that. Uh, but one, one thing we have going for us, though, Frank, we're talking about biomechanics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The body tells us what we can do. And you've got to learn the physics of the body and then teach it. Yeah. So it's not what you and I say. It's what can the body do? And, and we've taken time to learn that. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to teach to. Yeah. Are we perfect at it? No. Is there more to learn? Yeah. But that's, that's your base. I have learned a ton in the last year um, working with John Demmer and, and sort of trying to find like what the best approaches to the barebow world and you know you can't you can't look at a guy like Demmer and, and be like well, why is it that he's so successful why is it that his shot is so ridiculously repeatable you know what is it that he does look at his bow arm why does his bow arm not move why does this release look like it's static to the untrained eye but in reality there's just no extra tension added into it there's no extra added movement into it you know, and all you, you start to, when you start to do it, you have to do it. You have to be a doer to totally wrap your mind out around understanding why you do something the way you do it. And, and it's no different for compound or Olympic recurve. Like you, you kind of have to, you have to understand it. And, you know, the biomechanics of the whole thing is very well researched. It's not something that we are making up. Don't take our word for it. It's science. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not Larry's opinion, it's not Doc's opinion, it's not my opinion. It's just what the research says. Okay. You do with that what you want. But when it comes to archery and form and making changes, you have to be completely honest with yourself and say, is what I am doing working? If it is not working, if you are not improving, then you need to make a change and evaluate, well, where should that change come from? And then who do I go to, to try to get that help? Mm -hmm. So and along those lines, you know, Larry was mentioning a little earlier about the, the science of behind things. And if, if we think of that clearly, what I, I think we often miss a word, and I added this into the routine when Larry and I were teaching the various levels, uh, NTS levels, a number of years ago. And we talk about pulling up and, tra and transferring to hold, transferring the pull into your back muscles, which are incredibly strong. But that's only part of it. We are transferring. But what are we transferring? we are transforming the stored up energy that's produced by our contact with the earth, earth which is called gravity. And it's, it's, it, it, I mean, it's the old lever and the fulcrum. If, you, if this is your level lever, you have a big stone out here you wanna move, you, you, you move the, the fulcrum either closer or further away, according to how much weight you're gonna pull on, on the back, le on the back uh, uh, of, of the lever. And then you're gonna be able to move a remarkable weight with lot, as much effort. And, and, and being in, 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 in physical medicine rehab, teaching for years and years and years, you'll also come out of it with your, with, with your muscles and your tendons still intact and not produce a lot of great work for, for, uh, for orthopedic surgeons. I have nothing against orthopedic surgeons. I actually have friends who are that, you know, but why create the injury when you really don't have to? So we're transforming as well as we're transferring. What are we transferring? This stored up energy. And, and if, we aren't in, in direct, if we aren't using our skeletal structure, to make a lever, then we're going to hurt something, and you're and you're not going to do it the same way every time. It still comes down to the you know, Larry's statement from his coach years ago: our archery is a two part two part process. Learn to shoot the ten and repeat that. Yeah. Repeating it is is really the key to the great shot. Yeah. And keeping yourself in good 
shape physically yeah. to continue to do that. Once you get hurt, you you never ever completely get back to where you were before you were hurt. Yeah. Well, guys, we've used up almost our forty-five minutes. Yeah, I think we did. Yes, Over. we did. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and a half on a Monday, probably not on Mondays, right? <laughs> yeah. But we had, thank you for everyone who logged in. We had, uh, I think at most like 25 viewers on Facebook. So we appreciate Excellent. you guys. Um, sure uh, do. We, uh, Miguel, Miguel Cruz real quick had a question. We're gonna, we're gonna run, run this one question just so we can answer everybody before we cut this off. Um, Miguel said, how affects the stabilizer's weight to the setup position? Is there a formula to calculate the correct weight to use? Um, I've seen Miguel recommendations and ratios from two to one to three to one. Um, that's back to front. Um, I know that it's going to be shooter specific. I also know that Larry is not a fan of a significant amount of weight, um, necessarily on the back, but you want to comment on that quick, Larry? A good place to start is if you have your bow in a bow balancer or if you can grip it lightly with your index finger and thumb and let it teeter there in your hand. Uh, a good place to start is with the stabilizer, the front stabilizer 45 degrees down. And of course, roll balanced, but you want it pitched down about 45 degrees. It's an excellent place to start because that's going to help the bow react nicely when the string is released and the string is going forward. And that's what we want out of a stabilizer is helping the bow to act and stay in its vertical attitude as the string comes forward and drives the arrow out of it. Yeah, and so that, that's a good starting point. Yeah, and that response is going to be different for every shooter. Um, you know, like what my son shoots and what I shoot and what you, you know, maybe what Larry's bow reaction is afterwards. Or you can look at guys mm -hmm. like Steve Anderson, Paige Pierce, um, trying to think of who else, Tim Gillingham. There's a bunch of guys out there that all have different, the bow reaction. Um, oh, my gosh. Chris Perkins, another one. Look at those guys shoot on YouTube. See how their bow reactions are. That's what they like. So the way their bow is set up is going to dictate a lot of what that behavior is going to be after the bow leaves the hand. And again, that's that natural tendency of a bow setup affects. I know we're running long here. I'm sorry. Um, the bare bow thing, because in bare bow, we don't have long stabilizers. We're not allowed to have them. Mm -mm. We're allowed to have weight at the riser below the grip, either on the riser itself or in front of it or behind it. So that bow is only going to have a little bit of a rock. That big explosive Olympic recurve, and you can't see my hand. Hold on. Mm -hmm. Boom. This, this thing. Mm -hmm. It's not conducive just to the way the bow itself is set up. It's, it's because yeah. Yeah. the bow moves different. Uh, the reaction's different. And, and don't look too much to the highly experienced and highly skilled professionals. You're not there yet. Stay basic. Yeah, let's find what and works for you. Basic, I probably should have yeah. clarified that. I, I yeah. apologize, Larry. Thanks for catching yeah. that. We don't, we're not telling you to go shoot like them. I'm saying look at how they are all completely different. Yeah. have found what works for them you need to find what works for you yeah all right guys super much longer episode than we ever in a million years could have anticipated <laughs> but extremely good content those of you if you have questions this will be loaded uploaded to youtube you can always go back and refer to it um i will be taking the live feed down probably no i'll probably leave it up on the facebook page um and that's pretty much it. Thanks for following us. We'll talk to you later. See Super. you in the next episode. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Bye. Next week. <laughs>